In our last video, we started building a table view. We got to the point where it had a single column of data, uh, but we still need to add more columns, and we need to make it interactive so that it does something when the user clicks on a column, so that we would know, so that you would know, if you put one of these table views into a GUI, how to make it respond to user interactivity. So this is the code that we had previously. We said we have this case class for a student, which represents one row in our GUI. We made an observable buffer that has three students in it. We set up a table, and then we made a table column for that table. And on that column, we set the cell uh, value factory, which is basically a function that builds cells out of the values that are rows. And so it takes this uh, CDF, that is a column data, yeah, we looked at it in the API. Uh, the name doesn't actually matter to us here. <clears throat> it does have a field inside of it called value, and that gives us back a student, and then so name gives us the student's name, and we have to wrap that inside of a string property for that to work. I wanna add two more columns to this. So the next column, column two, and so we don't forget, Let's put it down there. Column two is going to take a student and produce an int. This will be their first test grade. So test one. This can't be a string property. Instead of using a string property, it turns out that there is something called an integer property, but in my own playing with this, that didn't work so well. So it turns out that just using the general object property, oops, works well for this. And we want this to not be name, but test one. <clears throat> and that is the test one up here from the student, because once again, the value stored inside of CDF is a student, so we can get a field out of that. Let's go ahead and let's try that to see how close we are. Hey, look, we have two different columns and we can alter sword ordering. Uh, go back to the default, there we go. So, we have two columns. Turns out our third column looks a whole lot like the second one because it's just going to be our second test grade. Not too much of interest there. But in some ways, it's the third one that I think is the most interesting. This third one, I want to be the average of the two tests. So it would kind of be the student's average in the class. And what I think is very interesting about this is to note that that's not stored. Okay? And this is kind of the power of the ScalaFX model for building tables. Because we get to specify these factories, they can be arbitrary functions. They can do calculations for us. So it's not like we just have to have a big two-dimensional array of a whole bunch of data. And in some ways, for your simple examples, that would be easier. But for more complex examples, that type of thing is actually harder. Okay. Instead, this calculates it off of whatever data is here. And so we have the ability to add in additional information of that, you know, that was calculated off of it, and we don't actually have to stick it inside of any a table ourselves. It's calculated for this. So to see how that works, let's go ahead and let's create column four. Now the average of two numbers can be an int, but most of the, but half the time it's not. So we're going to go with a double, and we're going to call this average. So we create another object property here. And the way that we are going to calculate this is it is an object property of cdf.value.test1 plus the test2 divided by 2.0 to get it so that we have a double. Let's add that into our table. <clears throat> and let's run to see if this code is happy. Sure enough, here we go. So we have Jane Doe, we have John Doe, we have Bob Builder. 
we have the test grades that we put in for them, but we also have the average of their test grades. And that was something that we did not put in. Uh, the fact that I made this the root does mean that the whole thing changes. Uh, you'll note that my table actually gets a little scroll bar if I manage to make it small enough for all of my data. So uh, it behaves very nicely. I think it actually looks reasonably nice and we didn't have to do all that much work to create it. The one last thing that we need to do is make it so that we can interact. So that when I click on one of those rows that we show that we know about it. And in order to do that, our table has a selection model just like our list view and our combo box did. And it is a property, so we have to apply on there. And then I can ask for the selected item and I can register code to be called when that changes. So basically when we select something new inside of the table, this code is going to be called. Now I didn't add a label or anything else, I made the table the root. So the only way that I can kind of show what's going on is to print out something about what we selected. So say that we selected, and in this case, we can ask the table, actually it's going to look a lot like this, we can ask the table selection mo model, the, instead of a selected item, we're going to say get selected items here, and that gives us back a, you know, a collection of all of the items that have been selected in the table. We run this and now when I click on one of our entries you can see that we get out a thing that says that that student was selected and it's actually part of a collection here. Uh, this is set for single collect for single selection so I can't create I can't select multiple of them. If we were to flip the switch and allow multiple selection when I did this, you would see multiple students printed out. So that concludes our coverage of table view. I think you've, you have enough that you can do some interesting things, uh, you know, maybe somewhat basic, but, but definitely interesting things with putting tables into your GUIs.